Let's get started with the final lecture video on this chapter of cardiovascular emergencies. In this video, we're going to talk a little bit about arterial occlusion. Uh, acute arterial occlusion and acute limb ischemia uh, are types of uh, cardiovascular emergencies. And occlusion can be sudden disruption of arterial blood flow that occurs because of uh, a thrombus, an embolus, a uh, tumor, direct trauma to an artery, or unknown factors. So talking about a thrombus, remember a thrombus is a clot that doesn't move. It, it uh, occurs at the site where it, it stays, and an embolus is a thrombus that breaks off and uh, flows throughout the body, right? So when the blockage affects an extremity, blood flow to the muscle is limited. Uh, during exercise, muscle contraction may stop blood flow, and the process occurs gradually, allowing collateral circulation to actually develop and still provide some blood flow to that area. If extensive collateral circulation develops, the patient may notice no change uh, or only mild increase in symptoms. So uh, if they have enough collateral circulation to provide, it's like a backup system of blood flow. Uh, then they might not even notice uh, that they've had a, a clot completely cut off a certain amount of blood flow from a vessel. And as I said before, an embolus is like a thrombus that breaks off, um, or a, an embolus could be a fat embolus or an air embolus or anything that includes blood flow um, that travels. It's the most common cause of an acute arterial occlusion, and it begins in the heart and it will travel to uh, the different extremities. Your conditions that favor origination in the heart include uh, atrial fibrillation, uh, clot formation in the left ventricle after an acute myocardial infarction, a uh, rheumatic or a prosthetic heart valve, and uh, left ventricular aneurysm. Of course, with atrial fibrillation, the atria are just kind of quivering, and the blood flow in the atria is not great. Uh, sometimes some of the, a lot of the blood stays back in the, in the atria uh, with atrial fibrillation, and it can coagulate. And typically those clots will just kind of stay there and uh, stay turbulent, kind of like the bottom of a waterfall. If you picture like a log getting stuck in the bottom of a waterfall, that's what happens with these clots getting stuck in the atria. Um, but every once in a while they'll break loose and they can cause um, damage somewhere. That's why a lot of your AFib patients are actually on uh, blood thinners chronically. Uh, arterial emboli can travel to v a variety of sites in the body, uh, but most lodge in the femoral artery. Uh, and most emboli occur in patients with significant underlying heart disease. Um, so if you picture that uh, blood clot of the femoral artery, um, you know, start picturing what some, some of the symptoms might be because it's going to cause a decrease in oxygenated blood flow distal to that. Uh, could you, they could have the paresthesia feeling of pins and needles. They could have a cold leg because we get a lot of our warmth from blood flow. It could turn uh, pale or, or cyanotic even um, or mottled. So all of these things are uh, signs and symptoms of your uh, blood clot distally. In the beginning of this video, I said you could also have uh, something like a tumor or trauma that also causes an obstruction of blood flow. Direct trauma to an artery which can cause, be caused by you know, an extremity injury, a diagnostic procedure such as cardiac cath, a dissecting aneurysm, vasospasm, usually attri uh, attributed to IV drug abuse, or a blockage of vascular graft can al also cause uh, you know, obstruction in blood flow. So ischemia results when an arterial occlusion suddenly reduces the amount of blood flow to an extremity. Um, you, you're going to want to note some of the following uh, as it refers to concerning arterial disease. The patient may experience intermittent claudication, which is pain due to the lack of blood flow, cramping, muscle tightness, fatigue, uh, or weakness of the legs when walking or during exercise. Symptoms occur as a result of increased oxygen demand during activity, and the arteries that supply the muscle uh, of the calves, hips, or buttocks uh, are narrowed or, or blocked by atherosclerotic plaques that limit blood flow to those tissues. Symptoms disappear after a brief rest, and the patient can resume activity until the pain recurs. All of these are 
uh, very concerning when it comes to peripheral artery, artery disease. Your assessment of these patients with different occlusions, uh, you're going to gather uh, an accurate history. If the symptoms occurred suddenly, an embolus is the probable cause. If symptoms started gradually, you can suspect a thrombus. Uh, find out if the patient has ever had a similar episode. When you're testing your patient, you're going to want to keep in mind the five P's of acute arterial occlusion. Pain, pulselessness, pallor, paresthesia, and paralysis. Uh, pain usually begins distal to the site of obstruction and gradually increases in severity. And then you may have a decrease in pain as your sensory loss progresses. Uh, of course, pulselessness due to the lack of uh, arterial perfusion to that area and pallor subsequently will occur, be paleness. Paresthesia is that pins and needles feeling, but it's a sign of life-threatening ischemia. Uh, paralysis is a sign of life-threatening ischemia as well. Uh, you're going to find out whether the patient has risk factors for developing a blood clots. Uh, do a recent extremity injury, does that, you know, did they have an injury to an uh, extremity? Uh, do they use uh, IV drugs, illicit drugs? Uh, have they had heart surgery or an acute myocardial infarction? Or do they have clotting disorder? Uh, have they ever had a pulmonary embolism? Do they have atrial fibrillation? Uh, contraceptive use also increases your clotting factor. Uh, so if they're on birth control, they could be at risk for blood clots, hormone replacement therapy for the same reasons, and rheumatic heart disease. You want to feel for arterial pulses, check brachial, radial, femoral, uh, posterior tibial, and dorsalis pedis uh, arteries in pairs and kind of compare the two uh, sides of the patient. Document your findings, of course. I'm going to review the skin color of the affected limb. Uh, the skin of the affected limb usually appears pale or mottled distally uh, or over the affected area and the foot will uh, actually turn pretty pale when it is raised and very red after one minute of placing it at a level lower than the heart. The skin of the affected limb may feel cool and may either be moist or dry. Um, so again checking for arterial pulses uh, is going to be very important and reviewing the skin color of the affected limb as well. After your assessment uh, comes management and treatment, right? And most of it's going to be uh, supportive treatment pre-hospitally. You're going to allow the patient to assume the position of comfort, you know, IVO2 monitor as always. Uh, and uh, if the limb ischemia affects a lower extremity, sit the patient up and place the patient's feet lower than the chest so you could try to get it, you know, perfused at least somewhat. Also give the patient medications as instructed by medical direction or your local guidelines, including pain medications. Please treat them if they're in pain and keep the patient compartment of the ambulance warm to avoid any cold-induced vasoconstriction, uh, reducing even more blood flow. Transport is going to be one of the most important things for this patient, so you're going to want to transport rapidly to the closest facility. Reassess the patient's condition frequently en route. Monitor those five Ps we talked about. If the patient refuses care, uh, repeatedly urge him or her to accept your assistance, including transport. Uh, they need to go to the hospital to get this fixed. This could become much worse. Consider contacting medical direction for advice and document the refusal. Very good if they um, decide they're not going to go despite your... Uh, efforts to convince them. Okay, and somebody with an acute uh, DVT is often somebody that has uh, thrombophlebitis, which is the development of blood clot in an inflamed or damaged vein. Superficial uh, thrombophlebitis occurs when a clot develops in a vein near the surface of the skin, and a DVT is just the pre uh, present if a clot develops in the deep veins of the extremities. It's associated with an increased risk of pulmonary embolism because that clot can break loose uh, from the lower extremity uh, and get into the you know, pulmonary circulation after being pumped from the right side of the uh, heart uh, and cause uh, severe acute dyspnea and even uh, some more problems other than that, obstructive shock being one of them. The three important factors in developing a thrombus, venous stasis, which is uh, you know, it's like sluggish blood flow. Patients who are pregnant, immobile for long periods of times, or those with obesity or heart failure, uh, you know, or, or go on long plane ride, uh, flights or car rides, they may develop uh, 
stagnant blood flow, which is called venous stasis. Also, damage to the inner lining of the vessel can increase your ability to cause a, a blood clot uh, caused by trauma, inflammation, venipuncture, or the action of agents given during IV therapy. And then your blood clotting disorders, of course, can also cause you to have a uh, DVT caused by dehydration, certain types of cancer, and the use of oral contraceptives or hormone replacement therapy. The patient with a DVT may seek medical care because of swelling, pain, tenderness in the limb. Uh, find out if the patient has risk factors of DVT. Um, one of the things I didn't mention was smoking. Smoking causes polycythemia because of the chronic hypoxia. Your body will actually create more erythropoietin because of the chronic hypoxia uh, because the, the body is saying, hey, we need more red blood cells to carry oxygen since we're not getting that much oxygen. Uh, and it causes more of a thick blood. So that will also increase your venous stasis. You're going to want to carefully assess the patient's upper and lower extremities. Compare the extremities uh, you know, in pairs when, when you're uh, assessing for pulses. Look for signs of inflammation uh, of the skin over the affected vein. Look for pain and tenderness of the calf muscle on dorsal flexion. This is called Homan's sign. You're, you're going to actually have them uh, lay flat or elevate their leg a little bit and you know push out like on a gas pedal uh, against your hand and see if they get pain in their calf with the dorsiflexion. Uh, again, that's called Homan sign. And be careful not to rub or massage the affected limb because you don't want to dislodge the clot and cause a thromboembolism. And just like what I was talking about before with a pulmonary embolism, uh, that would not be uh, the best thing to do. So these patients that are the post-cardiac cath patients that's kind of like your example of, you know, somebody that they're very careful that that patient doesn't move because they don't want a blood clot uh, to break loose and, and end up in the lungs or somewhere that can uh, cause them to, you know, have a pretty serious illness. Once again, managing these patients is going to be pretty much supportive. IV O2 monitor uh, for the most part. This is not going to be your emergent lights and sirens transport. If the patient refuses care, again, you're going to try to repeatedly urge them to go. Consider contacting medical direction for advice. And if all your efforts to convince them fail, make sure you provide really good documentation. And that brings us to the end of the cardiovascular lecture. This is the final video. Please review all of the lecture videos as needed.